This was my very first day on a murder team in the Met Police and I got the call to say, looks like there might be a, a, a job in Paddington down near Marble Arch. It was Colin Sutton's first day in the office and Colin said, Dave, we got a call, we're heading out. It was as quick as that. It was a funny sort of situation that day because we were quite literally thrown in at the deep end. We go to the scene of what we were told was a missing lady, hadn't been seen for a few days. This particular case was a very good job in terms of involving proper detective work. And it gave me an opportunity to see most of the members of my team in action for real. It was really just what I needed at the very start of my career with my new team. It was a crime of almost breathtaking callousness. Man who tried to kill her will never be free to harm The audio him. was too graphic to be broadcast. Colin Sutton was a detective chief inspector and senior investigating officer in the Metropolitan Police. He led the investigations into some of the most complex and high-profile cases ever, bringing dangerous criminals to justice. He showed her then screaming, the the night night out the gun. Attack. Another 146 victims. In this series, he will take you inside those cases and show you how he caught these criminals using nothing but pure detective work. This is the real man. Now been found guilty on all the 29 of those charges. The August 15, 18, the officer in charge described it as a senseless tragedy. The life sentence may provide some closure for his victims' families. When I joined the police, I had no idea what specialism I might want to do. I, I just thought, you know, I wanted to be a policeman. I wanted to, to be in uniform and run around chasing people and driving after people and catching criminals and helping people and all the other things you do. What I did know, I thought I knew, was I didn't want to be a detective. And it all kind of changed the very first time I went into a room where there was a, a murder squad in operation. I just thought, that's actually, that's a really good job, that is. I quite fancy doing that. It was just like a hopeless dream at the time. I never thought it would actually happen. And, and I was on a different career path completely, which, which meant sort of quick promotion to at least to inspector and working in uniform. And I did all that. And then I got the chance to, to go and be a detective. On the first day that uh, I met Colin, I immediately realised that um, here was a man that was very warm and friendly. And he was in a raincoat, smart suit, shiny leather shoes which policemen always have and I was probably in scuffed shoes which journalists always have. He's jovial, he's intelligent, he's a fair man and he doesn't let himself be led by peer pressure. He's somebody who's his own individual character. I've always just found him to be fair and sensible and straightforward. He was a good boss. Colin and I and other reporters built up a sort of good relationship, one of trust and, um, and I suppose understanding for each other's different roles. Colin Sutton joined the murder team that I was on at Barnes and it's the first time I'd ever met Colin. Colin is a nice guy, he's very personable, very down to earth and he is what was what I would call a collaborative manager, so at my level, the DC level, it was refreshing to have a DCI who would talk to you, at, you know, about anything and you could go to him about anything and there wouldn't be any airs and graces. He was quite a character. I first met Colin Sutton when he was addressing the team. He introduced himself in, a, in what I would consider to be a humble way. The team relaxed. We were a strong, capable group of detectives and police staff and um, I think it, 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 it enabled us to uh, hit the ground running. On the 3rd of January 2003, that was my first day with my new murder team at Barnes in southwest London on the western part of the Homicide and Serious Crime Command. And although I'd been the senior investigating officer on a, a few other cases when I was serving with other forces, this was 
the first time I had a team that was dedicated to only doing serious crime all the time. And I knew that in that respect, most of my team had more experience than I did. So it was, you know, it was something I approached with a little bit of apprehension. I wanted to, to make sure that I, I did it well and that I could prove to the team that they could trust me just the same as I was going to have to watch them and see that I could trust them. I went in that day and was sort of introducing myself to the members of the team and talking, and they were talking me through a few of the sort of current outstanding investigations. And about half past one in the afternoon, I got a phone call from the main office for the homicide group, and they said, your team is now in the frame. At that time, Colin was so brand new. I mean, actually, Colin, I remember Colin remarking, I think that day, he said, I'm a lucky cop. Everything I do, I get lucky. When a job comes in, usually a call will come in via, um, certainly in that era, uh, would have come in usually to one of the DIs or, or to Colin Direct, saying there's a case, there's a potential murder, um, and wherever that case is. We would then send out a kind of core team, core role team, to the scene, uh, which would involve um, exhibits officers, a house-to-house -house inquiry team, um, CCTV team, just to really start the ball rolling to try and gather as much evidence as we possibly can, in the, particularly in the first hour, which is really important. It was a funny sort of situation that day in some ways because we were quite literally thrown in at the deep end. You know, I didn't have, a, didn't have time to sit down and talk to each one of the officers and find out what they thought about things and, and how they worked. I just about moved my, my things into the office and we were out on a job. I suppose in some ways I didn't really know how best to deal with it. Do I just send somebody to, to have a look and report back to me or what would they be expecting me to do? And I thought, well, it can't really do any harm if, I, if I'm there, can it? Because if I'm there and making a decision on the scene, then it's probably the best way to do it. So I just grabbed a handful of officers and said, come on, let's go down and take a look. We very quickly have to step into professional manner and off we went in our various roles. My brother was exhibits, I was part of a general team who were combing the area for CCTV and other, other bits and pieces that we had to do. First thing would have been to identify any potential uh, witnesses. It was a 92-year-old lady who had been missing from her flat at Lanchester Court for the best part of a week. So I came down here with some of the members of my team. We met the local police and the local DI here and he told us this woman was Bridie Skeehan. She was a colourful character, an interesting character. She'd had quite a life. During the Second World War, she had worked at the American Embassy, and after that, she became an interior designer. She had a love of big, sort of ostentatious American cars. And she kind of led a life with the party set and the money set in London and was something of a, I don't know, a, a socialite, a sort of celebrity. Bridie had been married at some point in her life, but it didn't work out, she was divorced and she'd lived alone for many years. And now in her 90s, she lived here, she had a flat, she rented out rooms in it to lodgers. One of the lodgers came back from Christmas with his family while we were in the premises and he started talking to us. And he told us that Bridie had last been seen by Molly, who was her neighbour who lived opposite. She'd been missing for around about a week. And obviously with her age, 92, you can understand why the local police and, and indeed her lodger and Molly, her friend, were, were fearful for her safety. We got talking to them. They told us there were, there were two other lodgers, a, a couple, a Filipino woman and a Middle Eastern man who, who weren't here but that should have been here, that had meant to be staying in the, the flat all over Christmas. A pillar of the local Catholic community in that area, a woman who was reasonably well off, who had close friends. There was no earthly reason for her to go missing at this time in these circumstances. We went to the ground floor flat and we made inquiries with a lady who lived opposite, a very good friend. And she told us all about Bridie and that she hadn't seen her. 
gave us a bit of lifestyle and we went into the flat. There was a local detective inspector from Paddington Green and he was telling us what Molly had told him and what the, the sort of current state of knowledge was. Although there was the mystery of her whereabouts at that time, it would have been quite clear to those detectives from a very early stage that all was not right, and there was a very good prospect that uh, harm had come to Bridie. We had a uniform cop there with us, local cop, who was, who was kind of looking at the missing person side. So we went into the kitchen, and as we were talking, we looked around, and clearly the place was tidy. We didn't know it at the time, but it had been tidied up, but it was tidy. But on the floor, I remember seeing what looked like blood staining, just on the floor in the kitchen near the back door. Not enough where you're talking about bright red blood, but you could tell there was something there. But we couldn't get out the back door. The back door was locked. While we were there, one of the lodgers came back. He'd been away with his family for Christmas, and he you know, sort of asked what we were doing, and we explained, and he was sort of scratching his head and looking around with us. And I saw his, his sort of gaze was on some hooks in the in the kitchen, and it was clear that there was something, something had caught his eye, so I, I said, what's, what's wrong, what's the matter? We were having a sort of cursory look around the flat, and there was nothing obviously amiss, no signs of any struggle or, or anything that would have sort of raised alarm bells. But while we were there, one of the lodgers came back. He told us that there was a key to the shed for the flat, that ought to have been hanging on the hook in the kitchen and was missing. The key moment in this case really fell when the detectives were standing in her kitchen and their attention alighted on a key hook, a key hook missing the key, a key which eventually unlocked this murder investigation. I kind of looked at the local DI and he looked at me and we, we sort of shrugged our shoulders because we weren't aware that this flat had a shed which went with it. And the lawyer explained that, that if you go back out into the street and along to the end of the block, there was like a, an archway, and that took you to a, a sort of a service alley round behind the block of flats. And there were sort of brick-built outhouses. They weren't very big, and some of the flats had one allocated to them, and, and Bridie's flat did. By this time, the weather had become quite foul and it was, it was snowing really, really heavily. But given that the key was missing and we now knew there was another, essentially, part of the premises that hadn't been searched, we thought we'd better go around there and do it. We went back out into the street, walked round the building and ended up here, in the alley behind Lanchester Court. At the time, it was thick with snow and we went to the shed and, of course, it was locked and we didn't have the key. On the floor, on the concrete step, in and around, I saw what I thought was blood again. You, you can't be sure, obviously, without testing it, but there looked like there was blood on the inside. And it wasn't literally a blood trail, but it looked like blood, but I couldn't be sure. But we decided we were going to go in. Dave Leach put his shoulder against the door and very quickly we were in. And through some torchlight, we could see a lot of clutter. As is the case with all potential crime scenes, you try to limit the amount of number of people going in. Colin stayed at the door and I went in and I had a torch. And as I went in, I could see a large television box. Over at the far wall was this big cardboard box. At the very bottom corner of the television box was what looked like blood staining. There was a, a quadrant at the bottom corner that was sort of a dark reddy brown colour and looked as if it had been something had leaked onto it. And it was very ominous. So Dave Leach put his suit on and went in and very carefully with the scalpel just cut away enough of this reddened area so that we could see inside the box. I had 
had a torch in one hand and I was on my knees and I just cut the corner of the box out. We shone a bright torch on and we saw this fine silvery hair which was bright as head. As you can imagine, from that point in, we knew it was a murder scene and he needed to get the team down there. That meant local inquiries, CCTV retrieval, whatever route that Colin was deciding to go at that stage. He really had to just allow the team to, to do its job. Because he'd newly arrived, he would have had no um, concept of people's capability, who, who was strong in which department. And for him, and what he did particularly well, was to sit there and allow the DIs and the DSs uh, to divide the roles amongst the, 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 the detectives that were there at the time. And his role really was to be strategic and to, to concentrate his resources on areas he felt would be important. We waited then, went outside, spoke to Colin, got the team on standby, got them all racing down to where we were. When the crime scene coordinator turned up, we then removed, carefully removed everything from that particular box and then we in, it, in an effort to preserve the tape, we then cut round the box with the scalpel and lifted the box off. And then we removed some material from inside and then in a kind of fetal position, dressed in a dressing gown from memory, was the old lady, who even from the first look had clearly been beaten. And then we, would, we removed the body and the, and the body was taken away. We would have managed that scene very tightly and very, very, um, quickly and identified um, prime suspects pretty quickly. The last time Bridie was seen was when she went with Molly, her friend from the adjacent flat, and they'd been to Midnight Mass at Westminster Cathedral and they'd walked back from Midnight Mass together and that was the last time Molly saw her. She was reported missing in between Christmas and the New Year by Molly and we'd now got to the 3rd of January, so it was like getting on for, for 10 days that, since she was last seen. One of the things that Molly was able to tell us was something about what was going on in the flat prior to Christmas. Bridie supplemented her pretty sort of low income, really, by having lodgers in her big flat with her. Bridie lived in her flat with a lodger who was a lawyer, another lodger who was an accountant, and then that she had two other lodgers who were kind of a couple. And they'd been there for a few months. The woman was called Nympha Om, and the man in the couple was called Ahmed Al-Haddad. The lady gave us a, a bit of a flavour for who they were and what age, etc. they were. I believe she was about 49 from memory, and he was 24. It's an unusual age gap. She was described as the dominant force in the relationship. He would basically do as he's told. Just a young, impressionable kind of guy, Middle Eastern. And she was, I believe, from the Philippines. Once we knew the circumstances of the tenancy and all that, they became our prime suspects straight away. It was a four bedroom flat. Lawyer lived in one bedroom, accountant in another. And in theory, Ong and Al-Haddad had a bedroom each. But what was actually happening was that Ong and Al-Haddad were mostly, or always, sharing a bed and sharing a bedroom. And this kind of upset Bridie because of her morality, and she didn't want to, two people, unmarried people, living together under her roof. And in fact, Bridie, who owned the flat, had taken, because of this, to sleeping on the sofa in the living room. And they'd had words about it, and ultimately, Bridie had asked them to leave the flat and not to come back to it after Christmas. The old lady opposite didn't speak fondly of them at all and was quite openly saying that she thinks that they were the ones that, that, that killed poor Bridie. She told me that there was about 45, 50,000 pounds hidden in the flat and they found money everywhere, under the carpet in the settee under the cushions. They were finding wads of money everywhere and in the hallway, wrapped up in a towel in the airing cupboard, was a little safe with about, from memory, about 50,000 pound in cash. Everybody had 
disappeared from the flat. There was nobody, none of the lodgers were there. They'd have gone back home to, for Christmas. And likewise, Al Haddad and Ong were not there. From that point, resources would have gone into finding the people who were our prime suspects. And in particular, that job did develop into a manhunt. In the early hours of the morning, Colin had given some instructions that they'd made some inquiries and they'd found a brother who lived not far away off the Edgware Road. Several cars arrived and we were going to go and make some inquiries with the brother to see where, what he knew about his brother and where he was or where he could potentially be. Trying to find the missing lodgers, Nimfa Ong and Ahmed Al Haddad. We came here to these flats because that's where Al Haddad's brother was meant to live, and we thought he might or they might have gone and fled to stay with him. We came and knocked on the door and got no reply. And by this time, it was half past one in the morning, the team had been working all day, and I thought the best thing we could probably do was to go home, regroup in the morning. And we're just by the police car here, organising that, and a man came round the corner down there, and one of the officers, John Pickerskill, said, that bloke there looks a bit like Al Haddad. It was a bit of a stretch, really, a bit of a punt, you know, of all the people walking around in central London. But he went over to him and said, are you Ahmed Al Haddad? And the man said, no, I'm not, I'm his brother, but he's just behind me. And there was our suspect walking around the corner. It was quite remarkable because in an effort, he said later to disguise himself, he dyed his hair. But instead of going blonde, he had gone sort of orange. So you had this man with sort of dark skin and an Arab looking man with orange hair. During the second interview, he explained that when they uh, went on a run from London, they went out to Surrey, Englefield Green in Surrey, and his partner, Nim Farong, had said that, that he stands out in Surrey as an Asian man, therefore we should change his appearance. So she dyed his hair, at which point his solicitor said, um, oh, yeah, and that really worked, didn't it? And he just stood out like a sore thumb more than anything else, and he had done nothing. That morning, when I talked to my team for the very first time, I said to them that I wasn't necessarily sure that I was any good at being an SIO, but I did seem to be lucky in the past. And I think I demonstrated that to them straight away on the first day because they went to talk to this man. And there was Al Haddad, he came into view, and it was quite bizarre. My officers spoke to Al Haddad, and he was, he was pretty open right from the start. To the guys when they had him in the car, he made admissions, unsolicited admissions, rather than an interview. They would have asked him a few questions, they're like, where you been, what you done, you know, basic stuff. But what he didn't do, he didn't make any direct confession to being involved directly himself. He was there, he was part of, but he blamed him for all. He was never going to be uh, no comment or tell lies or try and lie his way out of it. He was quite open and said, yeah, we killed her and it was all my girlfriend's idea. And he said, my girlfriend and I have fled to a house of a friend of hers in Surrey, a place called Englefield Green. He was promptly put into one of our cars, and we, rather than go home, there was a convoy through the snow out into to Surrey to Englefield Green. And we went to this sort of modern estate, and there was a small sort of terraced house there, where she had a friend who, who spent a lot of time working abroad. He let her sort of house sit for him while he was away, and she thought that was the ideal place to, to flee to after they'd uh, killed Bridie. They were both then arrested at the Englefield Green address and separated and taken back to the police station. Two suspects are taken to different police stations, as is the uh, normal process in that, in that situation to keep them apart. Al Haddad was interviewed over two days at Richmond Police Station. Myself and another DC did the interviews first interview was fairly concise. He did speak to some extent, but it was very, very on edge. That wasn't detailed. Um, there were obviously lies and lots of gaps in what, what had gone on. Really from the very start, both of them just did that effectively, which is quite common where you get sort of two-handed murders. Each said it was the other's idea, the other's responsibility, then, and no, they hadn't had anything to do themselves, but they would tell you all about what their, what their other half did. After the first interview, he's obviously telling lies. Whilst we're undergoing certain processes that we have to do, i.e. fingerprints, fingernails, scrapings, 
hair pulling, all this kind of thing. And we're talking to him while he's kind of having a cigarette in a cage out the back of the police station. Now there are procedures around that process. Strictly speaking, are we interviewing him off tape? Are we, all these kind of things. But it's really about the police, us, identifying someone who should tell the truth and encouraging that. And that's what went on in that little interim period. And you, you can't put that over because that is a behind the scenes type effort to get this man to tell the truth. It's not arm up his back, it's not shouting in his face, it's none of that. It is a, you need to tell your truth. Your brother is, is really destroyed by what's gone on here. You've got a good family. What are you doing this for? What's gone on? And he cracks. Now that's not very often. From then on, it was about him playing down his role in the murder and pushing the main blame, if you like, onto his partner, Nymphron. When we started speaking to both of them, Al Haddad was reasonably open and was telling us roughly what had happened, but he was saying all the while that it was Nympha Ong, his older, more experienced, more cunning girlfriend who had kind of duped him into following along with her plans. She was saying very little. She was sort of no commenting and being pretty non-committal about anything that, that went on. She was hard as nails, point blank, like face like steel, unmovable, no remorse, nothing. So what we really had to do was to take the the bones of what Al Haddad had been telling us and see if we could find evidence that would corroborate the story he gave us because if that were the case and we could corroborate it, we could probably prove that Nympha Ong was the driving force behind this, this murder. He told us that Ong had been working for an estate agent in the locality and the whole idea of the murder was not just that they were fed up that Bridie had told them they had to leave and they'd have nowhere to live, but that Ong was convinced that Bridie had the deeds to the flat somewhere in the flat. And she thought if they could get their hands on them, they could use them to procure some sort of loan or, or some sort of financial advantage and disappear into the sunset together with a lot of money. So that gave us kind of the motive he told us some facts about how, how it had happened. And essentially, he said that they had, they had kind of jumped onto Bridie while she was in the house. And this would have been Boxing Day. And that they had asked her for the deeds to the house. She told them to go away and to get out. And that Al Haddad had taken her walking stick and beaten her with it and that was what had killed her. And then they had the issue of, sort of disposing of the body. And they borrowed this large suitcase. What that interview did is that enables us in the police to identify a number of items that were really vital to the investigation, i.e. to contact the exhibits team at the property to obtain a walking stick, the suitcase, all for forensic examination. So I phoned Dave up saying, you need to get all the walking sticks in that property and bag them up and the suitcase, and, and that is a big, that's a forensic leap forward. We retrieved the walking stick, and we, you know, it was clear that there was a bit of a scene inside the flat where, even though it had been tidied up, you could kind of work out where it had taken place. But we couldn't find the suitcase. Ahmed Al Haddad told us that they'd come here. He'd come with Nymphorong to friends in Penfold Street to a flat and that's where they borrowed a large suitcase in which they intended to dispose of Bridie's body. So we came here and spoke to the friends to see if they could substantiate the story. And not only did they corroborate it, but they told us that Al Haddad Nong had come here on Boxing Day, they had a little bit of a party, and as people do with their friends at Christmas, they'd been taking photographs. So before we left, they gave us a roll of film and said on there, there should be photos of our two suspects there on Boxing Day. When we had that film developed, it was quite ominous because one of the shots showed Al Haddad and Ong with this large suitcase, the suitcase in which they tried to get rid of Bridie's body 
and in which we found Bridie's blood. They then phoned for a minicab. Ong phoned and she specified that they needed an estate car because they had a lot of luggage. So they were going to move the body in the suitcase somewhere, but Al-Haddad said he didn't know where the, the intended destination was. To try to kind of throw people off the scent, I suppose, instead of ordering for the minicab to come to Lanchester Court, she asked for it to come to Connaught Square around the corner. And the idea was they would take the suitcase around there and wait for the minicab. But there was a problem. As you came out into the communal hall from Bridie's flat, there was a flight of steps that went upwards to the front doors and then you had to go down to the street. They put her in a suitcase and they called a cab, but they couldn't carry the suitcase. Can you imagine even a, a lady who was 93 and was quite frail, there's a dead weight there. I mean, it's a serious bit of weight in a suitcase. And as they were trying to get it up this flight of carpeted steps, Nymphong realised that there were fluids, blood, leaking out of the corner of the suitcase. And so they had to stop and, and reassess their plans because they thought that, you know, quite, quite logically, that it wasn't going to be a good idea to take a suitcase leaking blood into a, a minicab and, and try and escape with it. So they took the suitcase back into the flat and Ong thought about the shed outside and, and thought that might be a place they could hide at. And she sent Al-Haddad round with the key and he came back and said, yes, there's a, there's a box. They couldn't carry it. So then plan B, we'll have to put her in a box, put her in the outhouse. I think the hope there was that, that you know, they would make their, their getaway. So what they did was they took the suitcase with Bridie in it around to the back and transferred her into the TV box that we'd found her in. And then they went to clean up and they did their best to clean up the steps with the carpet on, clean up Bridie's flat, and indeed, clean up the suitcase that they'd brought from their friends. So we had a really good sort of chain of evidence for this. We've got the suitcase, it's got Bridie's blood in it, and in between times we know that Ong and Al-Haddad had it because we've got photographic evidence of them standing there with the suitcase. So everything that we were being told was standing up and was being corroborated. So it was starting to be a, you know, a, a good case. Ahmed Al-Haddad and Nympha Ong stood trial for the murder of Bridie Skian here at the Inner London Crown Court. The trial lasted for a couple of weeks and throughout it they blamed each other really. Each said that it was the other one's idea to kill Bridie and that they could make some money out of it. Well, during the trial, one of the things that came out was this change during the interview because it's not very often that happens and there was a defensive play, if you like, a defensive counsel play on the fact that how, how did uh, Mr Al-Haddad go from being given one story on one day to a different story the second day. But it was very well put by our counsel, Brian Alton QC, who explained that away as saying this is officers seeking the truth, which is in effect what we do. And that's exactly what happened. As the evidence went on, it was pretty clear that the major part in the partnership was taken by Nim Perong. She was some 20 years older than him and she pulled all the strings. And I think the court realised that. And although they were both found guilty of murder eventually, the length of sentence and recommendations given by the judge really reflected that Ong at 49 was the bad influence on the, uh, the young man, Al-Haddad. The trial went very well from the prosecution point of view. They were always going to get found guilty. The prosecuting counsel, he took them apart, to be fair. Al-Haddad particularly was still pleading, listen, I'm the young lad who fell under her spell. She just was hard as nails. And I think that was reflected in the sentencing in the end. After the pair were convicted of murder, the judge in sentencing them remarked that this was a brutal murder of a vulnerable victim for some sort of financial gain. And his recommendations reflected the parts that each had played in the murder, 
Bong received a recommendation to serve at least 17 years, whereas Al Haddad, who was very much led on by her, the recommendation for him was only 10. He's a murderer, encouraged by Nymphron, no doubt. And the, the whole process was engineered by Nymphron for financial gain. But um, it doesn't excuse what he did. Ong was clearly the main driver in the scenario. Her dad was accomplice, but it must be pointed out he was a willing accomplice. And yeah, he still went along. However, you might want to try and excuse his actions if anybody did. He still went along with Ong's plan to get rid of Bridie, get rid of her body, and to try and steal the, the deeds to her flat. The sentencing was a, was a real concern to us. Our Haddad, 10 years, and Nymphorong, 17 years. We all felt that was far too low, given what they had done to an elderly lady. A truly awful crime, and um, I think that, on reflection, that's probably the worst part was the sentencing in the whole case. It's a, a, a appalling, financially motivated crime, and I think in this era, uh, where sentences are, are much harsher, where there's a financial motive. Their tariffs would have been double, actually, what they were back then. She was just a lady who didn't deserve to end her long life in that way. She had let Nympha Ong into her home as, you know, as a lodger to provide her somewhere to live. And because Ong and Al Haddad wouldn't live their lives under her roof in the way that she wanted. She'd asked them to leave. But there wasn't any dramatic arguing about it. She just said, look, that's not what I like going on under my roof, so we, we're going to have to let you go, as it were. And as a result of that, Ong formed this murderous plan, this, or this idea to, to threaten and offer violence to this old lady to, to get some documents that, to be honest, she couldn't have done very much with anyway. It was a plan that was always going to fail in terms of providing a financial gain for her and Al Haddad. And yet, Bridie lost her life for it. And she lost her life in her own home, battered to death with her own walking stick. And then, you know, the, suffered the indignity of being chucked into a cardboard box to, to rot, really. I suppose it was almost like a desecration of her body after killing her, to treat her in such a manner. At that kind of age, having had a blameless life, loved uh, by her friends, by the people in her Catholic community, to end up like that, um, it, it was obscene. Poor woman. Poor woman. Just the thought of, of that happening to somebody who's 93 is just awful. Sadly for her, she picked two lodgers, which resulted in her demise, which is a tragic end to somebody who lived a, 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 a real a real life, I think, a real good life in London. And I think um, the people concerned in a murder were, were, were truly awful. It was a very good job in terms of involving proper detective work. In this era, it's very easy to assume that criminal detection is something which is purely forensic-based, using DNA techniques, fingerprints, and perhaps there are you know, less opportunities for detectives to apply their trade as perhaps they, in the ways that they used to before forensic advances. Uh, but this, this particular case was a good example of, of detectives thinking on their feet when the opportunity arose to move in on the case. And um, in this instance, it was um, in terms of finding the whereabouts, sadly, of, of Bridie's body. While, like in this case, we were lucky because there were circumstances that got us over sort of humps and problems in the, in the evidence for the case and meant we could prove it. And I guess that was kind of the the sort of thing that I meant when I'd said to the team, I don't know if I'm any good at being an SIO, but I'm certainly quite lucky at it. Colin always says he's a lucky detective, and perhaps he is. To be fair to him, I think you make your own luck. 
And I kind of recognised that in him, but lo and behold, that particular day, on his first day, we get the call and we go out. When they saw that key hook with no key on, that wasn't anything to do with luck. That was to do with moving in on, you know, solving the case, breaking the case, finding her body. And from that point onwards, once they knew it was murder, they had her body going backwards, looking at the suspects, immediately moving in on the right suspects, and literally shaking, shaking the case like a rag doll to bring about the conclusion of justice. Fundamentally, in the police, we are ordinary people doing an extraordinary job. When he came to the team, we were all strong and capable, and he didn't want to mess anything up, and he kept to that mantra. And it's to his credit that he operates the way he does. We all come to work because we want to put really horrible people in prison. That's our job, and he was exactly the same. Looking back, 10 years on almost, or 15 years on from that moment, I wonder whether that luck didn't kind of grow and work in a, a slightly different way. And as well as still being quite lucky in terms of being able to find bits of evidence and, and, and make cases, the sort of case, the, the number of cases and the, the sort of high profile cases that sort of fell into my lap somehow, gave me the opportunity to to do some work that most people, even in the role of senior investigating officer, don't get a chance to do. And to, to look at, you know, very high profile, public, important cases, and important cases where arresting the suspect actually meant that you saved other people from becoming his victims. And that's kind of almost the most important work you can do.